The government's new immigration bill was today debated in the House of Commons. The bill will officially end freedom of movement within the European Union and introduce a points-based system to replace it. We've discussed this on previous shows, but to recap, let's take a look at this chart from Sky, um, which you know summarizes what's in the bill particularly well. So as, as you know, this is a points-based system. How it's going to work is you're going to need 70 points to be eligible um, to apply for a visa to come to the UK. Um, the essential ones are an offer of a job by approved sponsor, so you can't come to the to Britain w without a job, like you you would have been able to if you were a European citizen while we were still a member of the European Union. A job at an appropriate skill level gets you 20 points. Speak English at required level gets you 10 points. And then you need 20 points from somewhere else in this list. And the most contentious one really is that you need a salary of £25,600 or above to get those 20 points. Um, now we can see, I mean, in a moment, we'll all debate the contents of that bill. But first, I think what was specifically interesting today uh, in the debate in the House of Commons was that it put on show two different styles of opposition on the Labour benches. Um, one where you say, you know, we're going to oppose this wholly because we don't agree with what the Conservative Party are doing. The other, which is a sort of constructive form of, uh, we will potentially vote for it with some clarifications. Um, let's start with the Shadow Home Secretary, Nick Thomas Simmons, speaking and summing up, really, the Shadow Cabinet stance on the bill. In the midst of this crisis, the government is putting forward an immigration system containing a salary threshold of £25,600 that sends a signal and tells people that anyone earning less than that is unskilled and unwelcome in our country. We on these benches know that people are not being paid the value of what they do, and that what our frontline workers earn does not reflect what they contribute to our society. Many of us didn't need reminding of that, but it seems the government does need reminding. Those who clapped on Thursday are only too happy to vote through a bill today that will send a powerful message to those same people that they are not considered by this government to be skilled workers. That was Nick Thomas Simmons there focusing on how the bill would categorise many people we clap for on Thursdays, people who are working in, in health and care sectors or any essential workers as low skilled and unwelcome because they don't meet that income threshold. Um, Labour are whipping against the bill on those grounds. Um, but Chair of the Home Affairs Select Com Committee, Yvette Cooper, wasn't adopting the same tone. Let's take a look. So I believe that this bill is flawed, but I recognise that immigration is needed. Sorry, I recognise that legislation on immigration is now needed. And as Select Committee Chair, I will put forward amendments that I hope will receive cross-party support. So in that cross-party spirit, I will not vote against the bill tonight, although if the government's approach does not change, I would expect to oppose it when it returns to the House, because I think it is immensely important. We should be trying to build that new consensus, and I urge the government to do so because it has the opportunity to do so now. We should be, we will always be disagreements on different aspects of immigration. But right now, at this point, particularly in this coronavirus crisis, we should be looking for the areas where we can find agreement and find a positive way forward. So Yvette Cooper there, it's important to mention actually this was the second reading of the bill. So the second reading of the bill is where you vote for, in principle, do you support the, the general outlines of this bill or not? Um, Nick, Tim, Nick Thomas Simmons and the Labour front bench are saying we don't agree with the general outlines. Yvette Cooper is saying I agree with the general outlines, but I will reserve the right to vote against it on the third reading. So her strategy is to say I'll vote for it now, try and get some amendments through. Um, and then vote for or against it afterwards. You can also vote against it now and also try and get amendments through. But in any case, um, I'm going to start with you, Aaron. I mean, it's a bit surprising, isn't it? If someone was to say, who do you think will be the first MP to rebel against Keir Starmer? You might have guessed Richard Bergen. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have guessed Yvette Cooper. Are you surprised by what's going on in the Commons right now? Hard to say. I mean, it's quite predictable. I tweeted this is so eerily reminiscent of 2015. And I was thinking in particular of the welfare uh, bill, uh, where many members of the shadow cabinet then, of course, there was the interim leadership of Harriet Harman, uh, abstained. And that was because it was the first reading, the second reading, very technical stuff. Now, given all that, and given clearly Yvette Cooper is somebody who is quite prone to that sort of technocratic bent, I think that's quite predictable on the one hand. 
On the other hand, I, I do genuinely think she has the completely wrong political position on this, given the, the present political moment. And I think obviously Nick Thomas Simmons has got the right one. On the one hand, you you would say quite rightly, well, the government have a, a, a mandate to change immigration laws in this country. We're leaving the EU, so obviously they're going to have to change in, in some way or other. So I get that. And also the fact is her seat voted to leave. Her majority is really small now. So a lot of these Labour MPs and formerly Brexit voting seats are going to feel like they have to lean into the kind of anti-immigration vote. All of that's moderately under explicable, let's say, not understandable, explicable. But the manner in which she communicated the point was just pathetic. Uh, and I do think that a vast majority of the electorate right now totally grasp and agree with the idea that people like care workers, cleaners, uh, should be paid more. And the fact that she's not willing to, you know, catalyze that conversation, also talk about the need uh, for workers from all around the world to maintain the NHS, to keep our streets clean, et cetera, et cetera. Not that she should be doing just those jobs, by the way, but clearly many of them do in these so-called uh, unskilled jobs. I think it's just it just speaks to her lack of ambition and talent as a politician. And the fact she became a cipher for so many for so long, uh, I think really speaks to the, the profound idiocy of what passed for anti-Corbyn politics over the last five years. I mean, in a way, I'm going to go to you, to you, Ash. Something that's sort of, I think, almost fortunate for the Labour Party is that this was always going to be an incredibly difficult issue for them because the immigration issue is very wrapped up with, with Brexit, obviously. Um, it doesn't you know, the Labour Party don't want to look like they are fighting the same battles as 2016 about freedom of movement. So I think there probably is a recognition on the Labour benches that immigration has to change somehow. Um, but they didn't really want to vote for it because, you know, in part because it, it makes them seem anti-migrant and in a way it is, it is anti-migrant. They've found now sort of a, a means by which they can oppose it, which they think can sidestep um, that particular conflict about migration, which is about care workers and the value of, of low, low skilled workers. But I haven't heard from them, you know, what they would propose as an alternative to this bill. So in a way, the fact that it's further down on the news agenda, because obviously bigger things are, are happening than, than bills being passed in the House of Commons, um, and also that, you know, the, the, the issue of, of care workers has come along has, has meant that they can sort of position themselves against this bill without really taking much of a risk on the immigration issue in general. Well, which is what, what makes Yvette Cooper's behaviour so strange. Now, I do think that Yvette Cooper, when she has appeared on select committees, she's been a very thorough and formidable interrogator, particularly up against Amber Rudd. I don't think that means that she's got particularly sharp political strategy. And I think that this is a case of where you're mistaking these like very technical, nitty gritty parliamentary, you know, procedural nonsense that most of the country either don't know or don't care about. And you're sacrificing the opportunity to make a clear moral articulation of your politics. And I do think that's important because we're in a situation where there is an absolutely stonking conservative majority. You don't have to be the make or break vote. Uh, you in a way, are a bit freer to actually articulate the things that you believe in. I think the problem for Yvette Cooper, and I think the Labour Party at large when it comes to immigration, doesn't really know what it believes in. It doesn't know what it can do and what it wants to do when it comes to shoring up this, you know, completely fractured electoral coalition. Now, I wrote an article a few weeks ago because it was the 10-year anniversary of uh, Gordon Brown's bigot gate. We all remember that. Gillian Duffy 2010 election, uh, Gordon Brown is caught on a hot mic saying, you know, why did you put me with that bigoted woman? And it was seen as this moment of, you know, high handed, dismissive labor politicking, right? It's, you know, condescending and it's unkind and it's ungrateful to its sort of core uh, base of voters. And it's that, that unstable, uh, you know, class of voters, sort of town living, north and the midlands, older, tends to be white British compared to a much more solid uh, BAME vote concentrated in metropolitan areas, Manchester, Liverpool, London, so on and so forth. And I keep got coming back to that moment because it's like, so what did Gordon Brown do wrong? And there's one group of people that say that Gordon Brown got it wrong because he disagreed with the electorate and it revealed the disdain for the values of the electorate. That was a bad thing. And other people 
would say that, you know, he, he should have taken her concerns more seriously. Now, for me, the point is about one of honesty and it's one about putting your cards on the table and articulating a view of the world and society with regards to immigration with a degree of honesty and clarity and acknowledging that people are going to disagree with you and, you, and you're going to have to make the case. Now, Yvette Cooper's backed off from that entirely. Uh, the new Labour front bench, when it comes to articulating the case in terms of you know, we're calling all the people that we're clapping on a Thursday night low skilled. So they're going part of the way to articulating that vision. But as long as you sort of frame it within uh, exceptional conditions, well, when all of this is over, it's going to be really easy to for people to forget that they did step out on their doorstep and clap every Thursday. And they're not necessarily going to make the connections between who's been dying uh, to, you know, keep the country going during this time and the kind of people who are going to be excluded from making a life here. Um, it won't happen unless you take the opportunity at these totemic moments to articulate a vision for something much better, much bigger, uh, much more compelling. You know, we know that probably around fifty-five to sixty thousand people have died so far, many in elderly care homes. In that context, it's—I it, it, think it's eminently pragmatic to say, "Look, we've just had tens of thousands of elderly people die. It's probably not wise to kick out uh, a significant chunk of the people that look after our older people in this country." I, I, you know, it's probably not the smartest thing to do. And I think, you know, again, at face value, most electorate will go, yeah, that's, it's probably not that clever. I mean, we don't know how far we are into this crisis. There may be a second peak. We could end up having hundreds of thousands of people dying, primarily older people. Our care homes are far from safe. Uh, it, it just seems like a really mad thing to pass this legislation. And Ash is right. Uh, the sort of disposition of, of, of Yvette Cooper Look, your vote doesn't matter. The Tories have a majority of 80. They have the numbers to pass the legislation. Yvette Cooper here reminds me of the kind of Democrats. You know, when the, when the Republicans are in charge, the Democrats go, well, you know, we have to do this thing and we can't be bipartisan. And, uh, and when the Democrats are in charge, like, you know, Barack Obama, the Republicans are like, shut everything down. Nothing moves until we get our way. And, and for me, that sort of that pathetic politics that you, you see on the centre, centre left, it's not really centre left at all, it's very much in the centre. I mean, I think that's really embodied in, in, in this performance we saw today. And Ash is right, doesn't, what do you, what do you think about immigration? We're leaving the EU and I think we have, I'm perfectly open about saying, yeah, that means you have to end freedom of movement with regards to the rest of the European Union. Absolutely. But then we on the left need to catalyze a conversation about what does a progressive immigration policy look like? What does it do with regards to uh, asylum applications and so on? And also we need to tell people properly, look, the number of people in this country over 85 is going to double between now and the mid 2030s. That's going to you know, increase uh, care spending massively. It's going to create permanent budget deficits. Uh, it's going to clearly stretch the triple lock on pensions. On a purely economic basis, and I don't think any of us would make that argument, you're going to need more young people, you're going to need more immigrants. By the way, that's not a sustainable long-term argument because the ageing trends are visible also in Asia, Africa, Latin America. It's not a permanent sort of argument, but in the short term, it's a, it's a perfectly coherent thing to say, and it's also true. Without younger people migrating to this country, without us having a well-resourced care, you know, care system, which will include some of these people working in it, we will have a really severe social and economic crisis around aging within 10 to 15 years. And so I, whether it's an ethical argument or a pragmatic argument, it's a really easy one to make. And hey, why don't you do both at the same time? Turns out Yvette Cooper can't do either.